Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is a question that came up. That's regarding chi. Like, is there a danger to having too much chi? And um, so the, the, the short answer to that is, as long as you're circulating it correctly, no. In fact, it's a the more chi, the better. And, uh, you know, but you do have to be able to circulate it. And I personally think that we have like regulating, self-regulating systems that make us feel very uncomfortable whenever we, you know, are overloaded. So if we're kind of packed into two, uh, one area too strong, you need to be able to circulate that or it will feel uncomfortable. So the, uh, the question is about, you know, okay, if I get rid of the chi by breathing and disappearing the chi, allowing it to, to dissipate, um, what happens when, you know, if you immediately want to, your body wants to immediately go back into a state of fullness and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's, that's kind of what it does. What's happening there is you're, all you're doing by disappearing the chi is getting rid of the stuff that's already been used, the stuff that your body has used up, just like, like exhaling your breath. You take it, you inhale, you circulate it throughout the cells, boom, and you, you exhale, you get rid of the, the uh, carbon dioxide and, and various impurities and, and waste products that are, that are carried out by the exhale. Same thing with, with the chi. You, it comes in, it goes out. You don't hang on to your chi. You don't stuff it into little corners and, and forget about it. You want to keep it moving, keep it circulating, and constantly renewing and filling up your blood with, with this vibrant energy and, and allowing that to circulate and move out and, uh, and the like. So the, uh, the key to being able to, to disappear it is, first of all, you really want to have a sense of rootedness. You, know, you want to be able to make that, that connection. So if you are in a central equilibrium, you're plugging into the big chi. So it may feel like too much if it, uh, you're not used to having a whole bunch of, of energy filling up the system. So you want to, so that that's part of that is just getting acclimated to the, to that much uh, power that is, that is in your system. But then you don't hang on to it. It's just part of just like your bones and muscles and blood and everything else. It's just part of you and it, you move it along. And if you keep that circulating, then it will uh, constantly renew constantly clean out and, and fill up again. And, and so then you're able to, uh, uh, you could then start to utilize it in constructive ways. Um, let's see, so the question was, um, what was the other question? But uh, what's, yeah, I forget now. Scott, did you have, a, did, did you have another question? No, we're good on that. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna move on then. And, uh, the uh, topic that um, I want to, uh, to uh, discuss today is something I've been writing about a lot lately, and it is, I think, really super important. It's something I've touched on a number of times, but I'd like to bring it back and, uh, and include something else with that. And that is your capacity to control your attention. So I think as far as, as, as I, I'm concerned your ability to control attention uh, is the most important ability you have. And it's, if you do it really well, it can become a superpower. That is your ability to, to direct where your attention is going and be able to move it and hold it in one place if you like. And that superpower is at the core of, of your Kung Fu. It's a core of spiritual cultivation. It's a, the core of, of energy cultivation. 
your ability to direct your attention, to control it. So some people have a little bit of a, uh, a back off on the term control. Uh, it, it's gotten a bad name and, and uh, they're with good reason. But in its simplest form, control, the word control is a neutral term. And it can be abused and can create all kinds of bad effects. But its absence is also bad. So your control in its simplest term just means the ability to start change and stop something. That means that you can intentionally begin something, continue it, and stop it. And if you're unable to do those things, then you're not really in control. You think of it in a, in a setting like a, of a, a car, being able to control a car is a real important thing. If you're driving down the highway, you not only want to control your car, but you want other people to control theirs. And you also need to be able to let go of a need to control other people's cars. And what does it mean to control a car? You have to be able to stop, start it. You have to be able to move it and steer it. And you have to be able to stop it. If you can't exercise those three things, you're not in very good control. And same thing goes with your mind. If your mind is churning, churning, churning nonstop, you can't stop it. You're not in control of your mind or not in as good a control as you, as you might want to be. Similarly, you want to be able to begin thinking. You want to be able to initiate thought. You want to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this other thing here and initiate a thought process. You want to be able to maintain attention on something and then say, okay, I'm done with that and move on. It doesn't matter where the thoughts come from. You still, as a being, as, a, as an entity, have this capacity, at least as a human being, you have this capacity to, to, to do that, to control your mind. And with that comes all kinds of good stuff and uh, be able to, to also not control it is also important to be able to let it go, to be able to, to put it on, um, on, on a different setting where you're just in a receptive mode. But even that is a form of control. You're, say, you're saying that, okay, for this time period, I'm going to just open up to whatever is happening. So let's just do a little exercise uh, with the with that just a simple thing. I, I broke it down in the simplest way possible because it's um, uh, it's something you can do anytime, and there are thousands of other ways to make this more complicated. And we do, we we do all the time. We because we get bored with simple things, but uh, <laughs> the ability to to just Break it down in its, its simplicity. Just put your, your hands on your, on your lap. And you can do it standing up too. It doesn't, doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it's, uh, and in, in the simplest possible thing, just with the index finger of your left hand, just point with your index finger of your left hand and feel into that and then put that down. And so with that, you've put your attention on, on that, that finger. Now with the index, with your right hand, pick up, point. Your attention is on the index finger of your right hand now. Now put it down. Now do the left hand. And what we're doing here is we're using the right side of the brain to pick up the left finger. You drop the finger and then point the index finger of the right hand. That's using the, the left side of your brain, the left hemisphere. And put that down. Now bring your awareness to your left hand and hold it there. And just feel your hand. And notice that by feeling your hand, you've done something else. You're bringing your attention to the feeling mode you're not thinking about that finger, you're feeling it. Now bring it to your right hand. 
and feel your right index finger without lifting it. And keep that feeling there, keep that sense there. And here you are again, you're feeling, you're choosing which level of brain activity is involved in this, in this action. Now think about your index finger on your left hand and notice the difference in your state of being, in your state of awareness as you do that. Now think about the index finger on your right hand. It's a subtle difference, but there's something there. Now bring it, your awareness to left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. And notice as you're doing this, it, it's happening in the present moment as you're doing this. So not only are you practicing directing your awareness, your attention, but you're also controlling a mind that ordinarily wants to go into the default mode network and just start churning out thoughts. So here you are, you are by directing your attention you are bringing it back to the present moment and sustaining that, sustaining that, sustaining that presence. Now bring it to your left foot, feel that. If you need to, you can wiggle your toes in your left foot. Now let go of that and go to your right foot and feel that. Now let go of that. Now shift it back and forth between the two feet. Notice how the brain wants to kind of turn that into an algorithm. We say, no, 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 we're, we're doing this on manual. We're consciously left foot, right foot. Left foot, right foot. And this way, you're, each time you direct your intention, your attention intentionally, you create new neural pathways that support that, you know, what they call an executive function of the brain. That is the brain saying, do this thing. It's what, you, what they call top-down processing. That is where the executive function gives a command to the body mind and says, make this happen. So that's a top down function. A bottom up function is where you sense something and it alerts your conscious mind to say, oh, what's that thing? You know, if you, and, and so, sometimes it's a dance between the two. An example of say a, a bottom-up functioning would be, let's say uh, a mother is, is fast asleep and the, uh, uh, suddenly she hears a toddler crying down the hallway. So even though she's fast asleep, the, it's a bottom-up thing. The sensory information is coming in, boom, and it, it alerts the executive function, must awaken and go see what's up. Go check that out. So that's a bottom up function. That's where we're getting the sensory information first and then the executive function responds to that. So we get that back and forth. And in our Kung Fu, we're doing both. Every moment we're sensing and responding to those senses, but are also making decisions to do this and not that. And it, the ability to do that smoothly, elegantly, and effortlessly, to a large degree determines how good your, your Kung Fu is gonna be. It's not just a random event. It's not just something that, uh, you know, yeah, I was born this way. So no, this is something we develop. 
This is something that it is developed through practice. That wiring does not exist until you put it there. And then you get to, uh, you get to explore. You get to use that and, and create new stuff. So before we go on to the next thing, any questions or thoughts on this? All good, all good, makes sense. Great, okay. So um, another way of controlling attention is, so is through the eyes. You know, we've been talking a lot about feeling as like really a primary kind of way of creating this body, mind, spirit integration creating this ability to, uh, to move into a super conscious state. But we can also affect that with our eyes. And something that martial artists you know, talk about is like having a soft gaze, having, and what that means is that you are, relaxing, you're not focusing, focusing on anything specific. You are, you spreading out and you're getting a wide angle view of what's going on. You know, they, it's called, you know, soft gaze, it's called uh, uh, the seeing to distant mountains, the hundred yard stare, the uh, thousand you know, the, anyway, the thousand mile uh, look, you know, you're looking to the, to the horizon. Basically what it is, you're, you're creating this, a flat field of vision, which changes your, your, uh, the way your brain is processing visual information. So you're going from foveal, which is focus attention, which is narrowing down and and looking for details in something, and you're shifting that to peripheral vision, which is you're allowing for a, a broad expanse and the, everything gets softer, nothing is in focus because you're, you're deliberately defocusing your attention. And with that, you shift your, your state your mental state as well. Because whenever your, your focus is detailed and you're looking and what's happening is your, your eye is flicking back and forth very fast because it is trying to determine depth of field, it's trying to, to determine movement, it's trying to do all kinds of things by making, so particularly if something's not moving, the eye moves back and forth to create the illusion that there is there is depth there, and uh, and does that by contrasting these the images that are coming in the, the two eyes and your brain sorts out the uh, sorts it out. Whenever we go to soft focus, that 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 eye movement disappears. So you'll see this. You know, a lot of times there'll be. You know, the guru will have this kind of half-lidded, soft focus, you know, but also martial artists, you go in there and, you know, if your opponent is coming in and they've got those dead eyes, the eye of the tiger, that is like, you know, okay, you know, this is, this is, this is dangerous. This guy is, uh, uh, he is really attuned to uh, an expanded awareness, a super conscious awareness that comes, that is associated with these, you know, this flat field of vision. What it, uh, it, it takes us also more into the present moment by, because it's actually representing the world that we encounter or that we experience as it is before we think about it. You know, it's kind of like an impressionist paintings. 
you know, you get, you know, your, uh, your Monet's and your Van Gogh's and you, know, you get these, the sense of, of things are wavy or uh, they're uh, kind of, um, the, 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 it's not sharply delineated. Like you get with foveal attention, which kind of bears down and it gets, you know, like a photograph, which kind of like gets every, every uh, nuance, every detail is, is carefully delineated. This is like, oh, everything's kind of wide, wide angle vision. So we're going to play a little bit with attention um, and, uh, and that different, the two different types of vision and neither is superior to the other. They just are utilizing different things. Oh, one other point I want to make about that is that whenever you're using the detail focused attention that you are um, collapsing time, that time is harder to get a sense of how fast things are going. If you want to be able to, to create a sense of slow down time where you're able to make perceptions much quicker, you go to the, the, the wide angle vision and then you're able to pick up much more, uh, uh, you're able to notice changes in the environment much better because you have, you're not locked into one thing. And similarly, if you want to create a, a trance situation, you know, you, you get someone's attention and, and collapse their attention on, on one point, and then they have a hard time noticing the other thing. That's why, you know, the, the, you know, the, the fake punch and then ba bam, you, uh, you, you want to irritate them so that, oh yeah, this is, this is what you're paying attention to. It's like, no, it's not, it's this one. So that uh, uh, whenever you're moving into that, that wide angle, you're able to, you won't fall for the, the fake quite as, quite as easily. So before we move on, any thoughts or questions on this? That, uh... Lynn. So I often, I often think about this in terms of when we're actually doing class and we're looking at the computer and how the computer kind of requires us to do more yeah. focused, is that, is there a way around that, or do we just need to practice this when we're not looking at a computer? Um, you know, I, I, like I said, each of those types of vision have their place. And okay. you're right, you're right. So like right now, I, I have a deep focus attention. I'm, and, now, and then, oh, I'm gonna look at Lynn now, and I bring it in and ding, you know, so whenever you are meeting, someone or something you want to bring it in you know you you like oh here you are you know you're you 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 let the your partner know that that they are the you know they're the, your focus of attention but then you ah uh, you can then fade to wide angle and just sort of include everybody and uh so that's the uh you know, so I don't think it's a matter of getting rid of it. It's just a question of when do I use it? So the, you know, what I want to do is an exercise just to kind of practice the, be able to shift just as we shifted, we played with attention there, be able to shift with the, our, 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 our field of vision as well. Sharon. A few days ago, um, I was playing with this because I was, again, looking at a computer screen in class and the teacher was in a beautiful woods. And I tried to pretend that I was seeing into the distance through the trees, but I couldn't, I don't know if it's possible to do that because I couldn't really feel it. Um, so I don't know if I was accomplishing what I was attempting to do. Is it possible? I'm not quite sure I understand. So seeing okay. trees into the distance. Yeah, I was like looking. I so saw I'm looking at the in front of me on the screen. 
is a tall tree and the sky. And I was trying to look way into the distance, even though it's just on the screen in front of me. Um, sure, why not? There's no real perspective there I, because it's all on this flat screen. Right, so all, all you're doing is you're shifting, you're using your mind to shift the mode. Trying to. Yeah, but you're, you're, you know, you're, you're able to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, get the, the feeling of doing this. And by doing that, you are creating the connections that you can actually do that. If you step out on your back porch and you look, you know, down, down the neighborhood and, and see what you look over to the sky, then you're able to extend your awareness further. So you're creating you're creating uh, uh, a, a practice session for doing that. I think with what you're doing there, if I, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. Well, she's, she's trying to look off into a two-dimensional space and that's what's difficult for her for, to do. I think it requires a little imagination. Because <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking the, off the information into the you're encountering is kind of fixed. And so, <laughs> right. Yeah. Look, looking well, off. You your imagination. Why not? You know. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah. But I didn't know if it by doing so, you, I think are creating new neural pathways. So that's cool. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, looking off into the three-dimensional woods is easier than looking off into the two-dimensional picture on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you practice the puzzle. Everything. Okay, Peter. Not sure quite how this, if this fits, uh, it seems to cut across the modes you're talking about, you know, foveal and just, and, you know, wide open. Um, a practice I've worked with, I think I mentioned it once before in the Sunday night discussion. Uh, if one is looking at something, gazing in that direction, the practice is to bring so in a sense, the focal plane, the, the plane of attention back from the object to the plane of one's own eyes. The eyes get wide like big saucers, relaxed, and you, your gaze is still in the same direction. You don't, you know, stop seeing things, but you sort of stop looking at things. And the, uh, the intriguing experience, when I, you know, I was really surprised when I first experienced it, is that uh, the object appears you know in greater detail more vividly with with more intimacy of connection um you know my my hunch is that's what what's going on is one is relaxing the act of looking and and then there's just seeing that it, that you're you're not doing in the ordinary sense and that's more intimate and more and richer it's it's an act of sort of relaxing your attention back to the plane of your eyes. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if and how that relates to this picture, but it may be a, it may be a, a parallel issue or a, a different issue. I quite understand how that would give you more detail. It seemed yeah, to be I think you have to, I think you, I don't understand, you know, I have a guess, but I, you know, I was surprised it's, uh, and of course, yeah, it's an interesting question. Is there really more detail or do you, are you just, there's, I think there's greater, there's an enhancement of meeting. I, you know, there's a, you know, I pull my attention back and paradoxically I'm closer in, in more, in, more intimately in connection with the object. Uh, you have a thought on that, Nick? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's maybe a tie-in between the fact that when you when you narrow your focus visually, the amount of visual information your brain can absorb and cope with is exponentially less than when you let your gaze go soft and flatten and folk, you know, out of focus, that that kind of far distant gaze. Your you're capable of reacting to a greater field of vision and a greater range of, of motion and, um, 
And there's also a different amount of feedback between your eyes and your balance and other and your other motor, some of the other motor functions. When you open your gaze and soften it in that way, your eyes become, um, in a sense, more powerful organs, right? They're because your brain can, can absorb more of the information that they are feeding you all the time anyway. But when you mentally focus, you lose all that other stuff. Hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's a connection between those two scenarios and what you're, and what you're trying to describe. Peter, hmm. yes. Interesting. The, uh, you know, I think you know, what you're saying there, Nick, uh, is, is, is accurate. The, uh, when you want to think about something and, and actually make sense of it, you have to, of necessity, collapse the field of vision, narrow it down uh, sharply in order to be able to, to, make, to bring it into focus. And so then you can say, oh, this thing here, this is, of, this, of all this information that's coming in right now, this is the important thing. You know, and, and the gun that that guy is holding over there, that that could be a threat. You know, uh, I, I should probably pay attention to that. And so what that does is you're, you're getting, seeing more detail and you're actually able to kind of cue into that shady guy in the trench coat with the, uh, yeah, the, with, the, with uh, the Glock in his pocket. And you, uh, so you're, you're, you're kind of aware of that. And so it becomes part of, you know, that becomes prioritized in your field of vision. But it, it's the soft vision that enables you to maybe pick that up in the first place so that you're able to like see uh, out of this vast conspiracy of information that's going on out there. There is, there, is a, there is a subject that needs to be focused on and then you can, you can bring that in. So it's a, I think it's, you know, we are given these, these different modes uh, for a reason. I think they, they, are, they are, have been developed not because one is right and the other one's wrong. It's that, no, no, they, they serve different functions and being able to, to do both and to call to control your attention and be able to summon up the state of mind that is associated with the the different the different ones is uh, I think it, it's really key here because I think if you uh, if you just tell someone okay use soft vision just flatten your vision out without context without a sense of why bother? Um, not much is going to be gained from that. If it if something is gained, it'll be by happenstance rather than by by design. But if we say, okay, we're going to consciously and consciously do this thing, and we see how that how that feels, then we're much better able to access that state of of uh, of awareness whenever it's appropriate in, uh, in, our, in our experience. So uh, let's, uh, let's stand up and uh, do a little meditation. Begin with, uh, actually, take a step out. Let's begin with the three pillars and just use our attention on that and just notice the effect of bringing your attention. So feel the balls of both feet, feel them making contact with the floor. Now feel the ball of the left foot. Feel how that's doing it. And notice by doing that, 
you must withdraw some attention from the right foot. But also notice whenever I mentioned right foot, that some attention went back to it. Now bring your attention to your right, the ball of your right foot. And feel that. Notice the effect of feeling that. Now extend your awareness through the ball of your right foot as if you're reaching down through your foot and into the earth. Like you're reaching down with feelers or tentacles. Extending your awareness down into the earth. Now, without letting go of that, now feel into your left foot as well. And extend your awareness down through, the, through there. Feel. They're reaching down into the earth. And just as we reach for that foveal vision to sharpen our focus, to focus in on things, we can also reach through the feet and sharpen the connection with the earth. But we can also do the other and do the relaxed focus with the feet. And that is where you just sung. You're just relaxing and feeling into the feet. Feeling those kind of settling in, spreading out. And notice that that has a different feeling to it. Let's go back to the Extending the awareness, reaching through the foot. That's a yang impulse, that reaching outward. You feel that. It's a dynamic action. Now go back and relax that, relax your attention, and just settle into your foot. Feel the sung, feel the yin, settling in. There is that dynamic exchange, both receiving the energy from the earth coming up through, and there's also the extending awareness through the foot and into the earth. And that young sense. Now reach for the crown of your head. Feel your awareness extending up through there. If you're going to reach up and touch the ceiling with the crown of your head. Now you can also think of like you're reaching up with a uh, like a like an extension a. Uh, well, let's say one of your tentacles, just you're reaching up there and you're, you're latching onto the ceiling. Now we're going to create a yin impulse there and hang from that. Hang from that tentacle. Feel that from the top of your head. So we're doing both yin and yang here. Up in the chin. And open the jade pillow gate. Relax your lower back. Allow your sacrum to drop. Reach down with your Weilu. Feel your attention going and extending outward. Going down. Touch the floor. Now feel your Weilu. Getting very soon, very relaxed and receptive.
push away from the earth, feel that you don't even have to rise very much, but just get the sense of pushing with your, your muscles as if you're going to push upward and then uh, sink down, release down into your quad, feel your, the, the, the yin support of your legs. Sung Kwa. Feel the index finger on your left hand. You can wiggle if you want, point, feel that. Feel your attention, placing your attention on that. Now direct your attention to the indexing of your right hand. Let go of the left and bring it to the right. Now feel both index fingers. Reach with the elbows, open that. Notice right now whether your vision is Hard focus or soft focus. We go into this, into the three pillars. Where does it go naturally? Now we're going to shift to hard focus and bring your attention to the computer screen. And just bring your focus to that. And by doing so, you're excluding most of the other information in the room. Now let that go and move into a soft focus, <coughs> bringing, allowing your eyes to see the, the whole room as a flat plane. where you're, this is a yin stage where you're allowing the information to come in, but without discriminating, without breaking it down. And this is what meets our eyes before we think about it, before we start to say, oh, that is a dog or that is a tree, before the mind gets in there and starts to interpret the information. This is the gap between thoughts just getting, allowing the sensation to come in. Now bring it back to the computer screen and direct your attention there. Put your focus on that. See the detail. Pick out some object on the computer screen to focus on. Narrow the focus even more. Notice what that feels like. Now pull back. Move into soft focus. And feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee. And with your right leg, you're gonna push your way from your to ever so slightly, just so feel that yang activation of the, of the right leg and then uh, settle into the right leg and spiral down to the right. So you're loading up the right leg and that becomes very substantial. Feel your awareness your attention going to that right leg and its substantiality. Your left leg has become insubstantial by comparison because you've withdrawn attention from 
the left leg, your conscious attention is now focusing on the leg that is supporting you. You pick up the left heel. Notice that as you do that, you have to bring your awareness to that, the left leg in order to do that. Doing that takes it away from the right leg. Put the leg, put the foot down. Feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee up, push away and then spiral down to the right again and loading up the right leg again. So we're feeling into that, settling into that and do that with that soft focus. Feel that, feel. Notice how that shifting into soft focus affects your state of central equilibrium. It uh, changes your ability to notice your environment. Feel the ball of the left foot. Set the left knee, push away with the left leg. You're coming up. Feel that yang, push away, and then uh, spiral down to the left. You're sinking, sung into that left leg, left quad, feel that, relax. Feel the, your attention going to the left leg and withdrawing some attention from the right leg in order to do that. Doesn't mean it's completely gone. You're still aware of everything, but attention is not 50-50. And it's not just one unbroken attention, it's directed attention. Pick up your right heel. And feel the sung into that left leg. So here we have a split attention. What do we do? Feel the yin of the right, the left leg as you're sinking into that. Feel the yang as you pick up the right heel. We can do both. Add in some elbows into that. Feel them as well. Feel your fingers. Notice the soft focus as you expand your awareness. Broaden it. Bring the heel down. The ball the right foot, set the right knee, spiral down to the left, sink into the right leg. Feel the substantiality of the right leg now. Bring your attention to that. Step in with the left foot. Feel the difference in your attention now. Take a deep breath. Push down, disappear the chi. Empty out. Please have a seat. How'd that go? Scott. So when we were doing it, we were just standing in one place. No matter how much I let my vision go, I would focus on the potted plant in front of me or something. You know, that would be one thing would be in focus more than everything else. But then when you had us 
focus on, you know, really focus on one leg, then everything else went soft focus. So is that sort of the, doesn't seem like how you explained it, but maybe I just didn't understand it. Well, what it does, what, what, that, that's beautiful, that's perfect. Cause what that does is it says, oh, so whatever, whatever I'm actually engaging in that body, mind, spirit integration that is, that is necessary to do that, to execute that maneuver, you immediately shift into the superconscious state. And with that, you find it easy to go into the soft focus. So once you have that familiarity with that, with that state, then you learn to do hard focus, soft focus as its own thing. It's something that you, you can learn to control once you familiarize yourself with, oh, how did I get there anyway? Oh yeah, I stood on one foot and wiggled my head and scratched my ear, whatever it is that, that you do, you know, to get there. And then you, you recognize what it is, what pathways need to be developed or reopened or you know, remembered or whatever in order to be able to, uh, to have this particular skill. Is there, is there um, so do you actually need some of the other ones to atrophy a little bit or, or do they all just get stronger? I wouldn't say atrophy. Atrophy would be, you know, means that. I know. Would you need one to be not as strong? So the other one, or yeah. Yes. Yes. In other words, if if you got a, if you're taking a, a picture with a camera and you go into you go into wide angle, you have to let go of, you know, the narrow focus in order to do that. You say, no, no, I want to take a portrait here, so I'm gonna. Rip you know, lock it down into Scott's face, then it's like, that means that everything else gets excluded from the, uh, from the lens. The same thing is happening with your, with your eyes and with your brain. It is saying, you know, but it's very similar to modern cameras where the information is still there. It just, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're excluding it. Whenever you like, say you crop a, a photo, you can still go back and restore it later because the information is still hanging around in there on the uh, in the camera, but similarly, I think with the with with our vision, the the information is still there, but we we only remember that which we focus on. Richard, a um, couple of things. First of all, as soon as you said, "Look at the computer screen." I realize how powerful motion is to capture your attention because I immediately, uh, <clears throat> lens fan immediately captured my attention. Um, so, <laughs> so then I think I invented an exercise. I said to myself, okay, the motion has captured my attention, which it always will. And uh, my task now is to stop paying attention to the fan. Um, so I think that I did that by, um, by softening my perceptive uh, apparatus. So what, it, so what I did, what I, but what I found was that I had to stop paying attention to anything in order to stop paying attention to the fan. Um, so I, so I may, you know, maybe that's kind of an exercise, uh, you know, to find something that captures your attention and stop paying attention to it. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. the other thing that happened to me early on when we were playing was that when you had us, and this is so strange because so many times, you know, we're told as students to uh, hang from the wire in the ceiling, you know. But when I did that tonight, I found that I became really soon. And then I let go of the ceiling and got really soon. So I, I don't know if, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just commenting on what my experience was. I don't, I don't really well, I have any, anything to say about it other than that. 
Yeah, uh, well, that was the first time I think I've ever done that particular thing where you you both reach with the crown but also hang from it. Because right. I, I, I think it's, you know, having it exclusively hanging gives a wrong idea. But I think once you've established the reaching, then you can, ah, you can let go. And I think there's some benefit that to be gotten from that too. So by getting both the yin and the yang impulse with the, with right. the, by, with the, uh, the knee one. Right. But I, I felt more soon than I have uh, pretty much any time. Fabulous. Uh, so, hey. and, and very, uh -huh. very interesting. Another, uh -huh. Another little trick in the quiver. <laughs> <laughs> Another arrow. It sounds like the reaching established the connection, but he didn't have to keep reaching because the connection was already there. So he could then. The connection was the connection was very the connection was very strong. It was surprising how relaxed everything was when I when I hung from the connection. Nice, nice. Yeah, the uh, the reaching establishes tensegrity. In, in, the, in the body by lengthening the spine, opening the back and, and creating you know, the, a pull between the feet and, and, and the top of the head. So that tensegrity then, then opens up energy channels, which whenever we're in a collapsed structure are jammed up, so that does that. But if say, okay, once I've done that reaching, just like Maria was saying, it's like, oh, I've made the connection, good, now I can, ah, oh, I can kind of hang from that, and that kind of that's kind of cool, Scott. Yeah, I I had the just about the exact same experience, Richard. I mean, like I was relaxed down to my toenails when I did that. <laughs> but what um, but what I was while you were talking, I was practicing. I was realizing I can actually just now. I now that I've done that, I can bring that. I can bring that feeling back really easily. Ah, yeah. Nice. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Good. Valerie. I don't know if this is my simple mind or not, but I find that when I go soft focus, okay, I get closer to, or I'm either closer to or in that place where I'm between thoughts. So I consciously have to think, no, keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> Because otherwise, you're just talking and it's like, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens anyway. <laughs> hey, pay the man no mind. <laughs> hey, blathers on. <laughs> but I did find that interesting, that the soft focus, yes, truly in all senses, it just kind of goes panoramic and... Yeah, not wanting to miss what you're saying, making a conscious decision where my, you know, intentionally paying attention to is just your words. I think that's a really good point. And I, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how these are both important skills. And it's part of super consciousness to be able to do both, to be able to move into all is one, everything is everything. And then kind of, rip. but this one thing here, I want to talk to you about that, you know, and be able to to direct it in, into into something that making something substantial by make putting attention on it, you know, by bringing it to into focus, and then it substantializes it, and so at that point, everything is not one. It's this this thing here. That's 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 got my attention right now, and at what point we have. We've opened up to the dance of, of, of opposites, the dance of polarities, the minute we say, oh, yeah, that thing over there. So being able to do both, uh, your, your point is, is well taken because I've, you know, I've kind of gone into that, uh, that, that soft focus state and, and kind of tuned out the world at, at various times. Like, yeah, it's nice, but, but you know, we got some work to do here. Let's, let's go back and... <laughs> And focus on something. So, uh, Peter. Yeah, you know, I'm I, I'm thinking more about the 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 aspect of this that I was trying to get at, and I'm thinking now that it may be kind of a Wu way, a Wu way of uh, seeing. Um, 
I, I often think of three, you know, working with three aspects of authentic action, authentic movement, um, not rushing, not striving, nothing extra, no extra effort, no extra extra activity, and mysteriously as if it's happening by itself. And I'm thinking that, you know, what I'm, what I'm noticing with that experience I was talking about is that, that I, I, I think it's, it's sort of a discovery of more authentic seeing, um, which is, you know, less, um, less sort of looking, more, less looking, more seeing, less, uh, less, less of an effort. Um, and, and then it's sort of, you're not doing it. It's just, you know, it's like the thing you're looking at is showing itself to you. It has that quality. Um, so I think that there, there's, you know, I, I feel a little caution for all its for all its splendor of the kind of cognitive science framework. Uh, you know, selective attention is a big term in neurophysiology and cognitive science, and I think that's of course a big important piece. But I I, I think that the um, the Wu way of of perceiving and seeing also you know sort of less action gives us more awareness. I think that goes outside of the cognitive science picture. I don't, I don't know about that last point that goes outside okay. of the cognitive science picture, but it certainly is, you know, what, what you're describing is the yin aspect of the soft focus. I see. And, I see. and so it's, it's, it's one setting on the dial and, you know, it, it gives us a certain way of perceiving the world. I'm saying that if, you know, it's not the only way, it just, it's not even the best way. It just happens to be a way. And it, uh, it establishes a foundation for a more detailed examination, which involved conscious thought at that point. Hmm. The, the, that which happens outside of thought, that happens in a gap between thoughts, is a way of seeing things that precedes thought but it doesn't mean it's necessarily better because we're humans and we kind of like to think and we like to talk and we like to, to express things in language and things like that, which requires narrowing focus and excluding information in order to make that happen. But this is, a, you brought up an important point there. I think it's something that, unfortunately we're out of time, so we, uh, we can't get any deeper into that, but I think it's something that, that certainly is a, uh, uh, worth a, uh, another look. So um, we're going to uh, sign off now. Thank you all so much. It's been great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Love Bye. you all. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>